Well, hello there. Welcome to the Hoopercast. Been a little bit since I've said that. Um, as you may know, I was doing some episodes during the hiatus. I was cheating. I mean, too many cheat meals. And then one, one day I was recording an episode and I realized I don't want to talk about any of this film news. So I stopped and that was it. Are we back now? Um, not officially as of this intro recording. Um, I just wanted to get everyone together because we had all actually seen, seen the same new release. We all saw the Batman and I was just like, we had so much fun doing the mummy recording. I wanted to get everyone back together and talk about the Batman. So without much ado, here's me and my friends, the usuals talking about, <laughs> fuck, talking about the Batman. Thing killing me lately. I hear you, man. I'm Getting old, old fucking sucks. Sitting in a chair in my house for two fucking years sucks. I fucked my back up. I don't know if I told y'all, like about a year ago, and I had to go to the doctor like several times and shit. I like pulled out, I was carrying my golf clubs. That sounds old. Anyway. <laughs> And uh, then I came back and I was working from home. And I like sat in my office chair and I was like, oh, my back is fucked up. And it was fucked up for like two or three months. Like I had trouble like getting around and even yep. like, yeah. And then I was like, I'm going to go for a run. And that didn't help. And then it like extended it for like a month. It was, it was fucking terrible. Yeah. I have this like, if I'm laying flat and I need to go from here to about here, it's like, yeah. Gah! And then yeah. I get past that. I'm like, oh, I'm good. Are talking about your backs? Yeah. Yeah. Y'all's back starting My back. To, My back. Y'all's y'all, back starting to fail. Oh, yeah. I started yeah. stretching and I think I fucked up. Because <laughs> <laughs> one day I was like, hmm, I can't touch my toes. Let's try stretching. And then I stretch for a week and then my back has been fucked up for about three weeks. So, oh, man. Oh, I need to get some agua. I'll be right back. Oh, I'll get some too. Oh, I just fucking. Oh, fuck. No. That that wasn't even back related. I literally I leaned back. Need to take your vitamins. No, I leaned back and I have this IKEA chair with these. Like there's four points of contact with the chair, but they're super fucking tiny. And I leaned back and put my toe directly under one of them. Oh, oh. I thought it was your back. Oh, I was like fucking hitting your toe with a ball peen hammer. John was like, I need to get some water. And you're like, I need to stand up. Oh, my back. And and I, no. I was holding my chest because I've had terrible reflux all day. Oof. Horrible so reflux. And that's what I was thinking. I was like, we're all just falling apart. Like uh, I have had bad. That's why my voice sounds like this. My have I've had reflux so bad. I sounded normal this morning, but I've had like a little like lava ball of of acid bro. sitting at the bottom of my throat, right under my Adam's apple all day. Mm. And around eleven thirty this morning, it got so bad. I thought I was having a heart attack. Like it, it, I I, Jesus. I I managed to like chug a bunch of water and get it out of my throat. And I was like, okay. And it just concentrated oh. in my sternum, and it just. <laughs> It started pushing out, and I was like, oh, my God, I'm home alone. What if I'm dying? (laughs) You get, like, xenomorph blood in your esophagus. It's horrible. It's so horrible. All I want to do is burp, but every time I try to burp, I'm about, like, it's like that what's-his-face from The Incredibles 2. I think his name's Reflux, isn't it? I think so. He just, like, it's just, like, a bunch of liquid acid. He just (laughs) just throws up acid on people. (laughs) Yeah. I'm at the tail end of a sinus infection right now. It's just like the weather in Florida is fucking terrible. And there's like pollen and all this awful human yeah. shit everywhere. We, we, and we keep, it keeps heating up. And then we keep getting, uh, I'm sure you two in, in Texas, uh, Callum, we keep getting uh, storms with cold fronts. And so the weather keeps yeah. going, woo. And like, yeah, yeah, and yeah. My, my face is trying to adjust to it. Yeah. And I'm pretty used to it over the years. It's, it's a pretty normal Texas thing for a, 
like my mom is like the only thing we ever talk about when she calls. She's like, how's the weather? <laughs> and like one time she called me and I was like, it's 85. And she's like, whoa. And then she called me a couple of days later and she's like, how's the weather? And I was like, it's 31. She was like, what? <laughs> I was like, yeah, dog. Biggest temperature swing on record. Yeah, it was uh, it was 27. Mom, dog. It was 27 oh. on Saturday morning here. Yeah. yeah. I, th- I thought it was a good opportunity to talk about the Batman because we all happened to see it. Um, so uh, I figured since, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to, you know, cause the entire conversation to wait on Dustin, but I figured that gave us time to kind of go around and give our thoughts on it. Um, uh, yeah. I figured John, maybe you could go first cause you've seen it the most recently of all of us. Right. Didn't you see it over this weekend? Yeah. I saw it Saturday and I saw it in the Dolby. So I think that, that helped my impression of it, but, um, yeah, I loved it. Um, I thought it was, I thought it, everything really worked. Um, can you all hear me? Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> perfectly framed sorry yes Wendy Burgess Meredith um but yeah no I really loved it I I tried to avoid reading about it before I went in I like going to these movies fresh um and so it was a surprise for me um I love Matt Reeves uh his two Planet of the Apes movies are like some of my favorite movies that have come out in the last decade and um i thought the direction was fantastic i thought the score was great uh the performances were great it made batman scary again uh which was something that had kind of been lacking even in the later nolan movies yeah it i thought it was just fantastic all the way through it was long i felt like it was justifiably long but it was long uh you could definitely kind of feel the weight of the movie um, I, uh, or the uh, length of the movie. I think if I had one criticism, it would probably be that. Yeah, overall, I, I really, really enjoyed it. I would say it's probably my favorite Batman film since The Dark Knight. I would, I would put it in the same ballpark as that film, honestly. Kellen, what about you? I kind, I basically like. I mostly agree with John, but um, I'm such a grumpy old man. Uh, when I when they announced the runtime, I basically like spent. Th- until, like when they announced that to when I went to the movie, just going, you're going to hate that it's long. You're going to hate that it's long. Get over it. Get over it. Get over it. And I didn't get over it. I, um, <laughs> that, uh, I think if, if a movie is over two hours long, an editor or director didn't do their job. Um, so I thought it felt every minute of three hours and fifty or two hours and 55 minutes. Um, but that's the final time. Yeah. Good. <laughs> but but what was there was good. And uh, my immediate reaction when I stood up, you know, the credits were rolling was uh, m- not necessarily me, but someone could edit this movie down by 45 minutes and it would have been better for it. So I gave it a I gave it like a B. A B. B. <laughs> yeah. A, a um, B. And, and it's and it's uh, it's it's way good compared to, you know, recent stuff they've been doing with Batman, like the Ben Affleck and we don't even need to talk about Batman versus Superman, but um, yeah, I think it made stumbles with the character of Bruce Wayne, but it made up for it by having a really good Batman. We can get into like more of it, but I think it, it it excelled when it was small and it stumbled when it tried to make itself big. So I just don't think the climax culmination was really as satisfying as I wanted it to be. All right. This was my first time back in theaters since Spider-Man Far From Home. It's been almost three years since I've been in a movie theater. Um, Wait, since Far From Home? Yeah. Oh, my God, man. Yeah. (laughs) The last time I went into a movie theater. I like I like just for a second, I let that comment pass and I was like, oh, I mean, this is kind of like my first movie since Spider-Man. And then I was like, oh, no, he needs the other. Oh, my God. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the last time I stepped in a movie theater, I I had half as many children <laughs> as I have now. <laughs> yeah, so I, I went to this theater called The Nexus that's nearby. It's near my house. It's assigned seating. It's meals, drinks. Um, I believe I sent you all a picture of my menu uh, when I was sitting down. I had chicken tacos and uh, uh, a Jameson, and I had I was I was sitting on a Lazy Boy. Um, and I was in a room that only this place 
like only has two, he only had like two screens, like two small theater screens. And then someone told me, yeah, they're playing the Batman 30 times on Saturday. I was like, how are they doing that? It's not possible. And I found out that they had converted like almost every little nook and cranny, every like room or area of that building somehow got converted to some size of a theater. So the theater I saw it in uh, seated 16 people. <laughs> it was four rows of four. How big was the screen? Because I'm like, if I went into a room and somebody had wheeled in a, a fucking TV or something, I would have been like, I'm out of here. <laughs> we already well, got your it, money. It was, like a, it was like a cinema. I mean, like about as big of a screen as the, the theater downtown. Um, probably not as big as, you know, what I, I wish I knew Dustin would know the, the different classifications of theater screen in size. But um, I mean, it's it, it was it's a small theater, but it was still like a big screen. Like you're sitting there and the thing is filling up your periphery so um plenty big um and with with really good sound uh so uh i enjoyed my experience i saw it on a saturday night i saw it opening weekend and um at like 9 p.m or something uh, so i got out of there and it was midnight <laughs> and, um but uh i i really enjoyed it i didn't have any expectations going in other than matt reeves and you know the same as you john loving the apes movies and um, just d- generally being a fan of how he conducts his craft, how he likes to how he likes to direct. I'd listen to a lot of interviews and commentaries with him and just I would just I would listen and go, yeah, yeah. Like, I, I like that. Like, I like the way you said that. I like the way you approached that. I, I, I appreciate your your whole filmmaking philosophy. And um, so, of course, when way back when they announced he was doing this, I was like, that's great. I think a lot of us had the same thought, which was you know, if they're going to go for a much more detective centric, you know, graphic novels, Batman type of thing, that's going to be, I think I, in particular, one of my sticking points was, um, you're going to have a lot of nonverbal storytelling as we're looking at stuff and remembering stuff and shooting inserts and just looking for clues, but not necessarily talking about looking for clues. And I remember thinking, you know, one of the best things about the Apes movies is the nonverbal storytelling. It was the shot design. It was, we have characters just talking in subtitles and sign language and a whole lot of just wordless uh, tension. And I was like, well, that's, that's what a Batman movie needs. Uh, And I was uh, pleased with uh, the final product here. It's definitely long. Um, I only checked my phone a few times because I was away from my house and my kids and I was just making sure nothing was happening. So every time I looked at the phone and saw no text from my wife, I saw what time it was and I was like, oh, I'm now aware of the time. But if I think if I hadn't looked at it, I think it would have, you know, kind of just not not been an issue. The performances, I think, were a big, big strength in this. Uh, The music was really great. I love the cinematography. We can talk more about the specifics as we get into it, I suppose. But just in general, like, you know, only one person has asked me, you know, how's the movie? And I just said, oh, it's worth it. You know, you should, I recommend it. And so that's, that's my general note is I recommend the movie. Um, you know, I think that it's a good, a good Batman movie. Um, and, but more than that, it's just a good crime film. Um, first and foremost. So, um, I think I appreciated feeling like there were usually I'll say this and then I'll relinquish the, the conch. Um, normally when I come out of a movie and I don't feel that much, like in terms of like, what did I think? I don't know where to start. I used to think like, I must not have left an impression, but I sort of realized that like in the absence of something jumping out at me as bad, that usually means this was probably good. You just need to settle on it and make sure. So I took like a week and I just sort of allowed things to come up. And so I came away thinking like, okay, this must've been a good movie because I, nothing is jumping out at me as like terrible filmmaking or bad decision-making or stuff that doesn't track. Um, it's definitely long. Um, I, 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 there, there was an early talk conversation with me taking my wife to this. And then uh, I was like, Oh, it's three hours long. She was like, what? Uh, never mind. <laughs> She's like, peace. She was like, never mind. Uh, no, thanks. I was like, okay. So, um, yeah, I, I think, uh, the standout to me, not the standout performance necessarily, but I think just looking at Kellen's screen, I, I really think that 
Colin Farrell was really good in this. Um, I, I, I really loved every single scene with the penguin. It's, I don't know how in the world Matt Reeves was like, you know, it'd be a good penguin, Colin Farrell. Um, but I, I, I enjoyed it. Uh, he's, he's nothing like the comics penguin. <laughs> um, at least, you know, he's not a squat Englishman. Um, but I, I just, I, I liked this movie and, and, and the world felt very, very, um, lived in the characters didn't feel simply like ancillary people there to just bolster Batman or Gordon or anyone else. Like it felt like an actual city with characters who had lives and like even the small little scene with like the, the new acting captain or whatever of the, you know, like the guy with the high voice. Okay, Jim. Okay, Jim. You want to do this, Jim? (laughs) Even that guy was like, like, someone needs to check on that man. He sounds ill. (laughs) But like he, even he felt like a real person and not just like, I'm just here for this one scene, Jim. And then I'm gone. Like he felt like a person with a life. I don't know. I can't. And so I just, I don't know if that's the direction. I don't know if that's just casting really good character actors um, or what. So uh, yeah, we, we can talk more, but I'm, I'm just monologuing. So I'll, I'll, I'll be a stand in Dustin for a second and tell you the very small snippets. We had probably about a 20 minute text conversation about it. Um, we were giving uh, out of 10 scores and he said probably an eight, um, I, and I said, I'd love it for it to be 45 minutes shorter and easily could have been so. And he said, yeah, totally same page. He feels like it sits beneath Batman begins in the dark Knight on the spectrum of live action Batman movies. So I'm assuming he's implying that he likes it more than the dark Knight rises. Um, but that it's sat between or below those two as the top. So I guess he's saying it's his third, third favorite, unless, <laughs> unless that's, I don't know how I actually don't know how he feels about the Burton movies. To be honest with you, I think he likes the Burton movies, but well, I don't think he likes them as much as those those two gotcha. you mentioned. Gotcha. So I guess this is his third favorite. Um, Not, I don't want to speak for him. Well, I am <laughs> based on I'm, what I know. I'm reading between text lines, I suppose. <laughs> um, that's his general consensus. Uh, we were talking. Maybe this is a good segue for a, a wider conversation with you all. But um, I was talking about how much it reminded me of Batman Begins. Like everybody's going to compare it to what they have in most recently in mind for the, the, the Nolan, Nolan films. Yeah. Um, and if you really think about it, like Gotham as a place and like the, the tone and styling of the second and third films, like Gotham just became Chicago. It, it almost, they stopped trying to hide yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but in Batman begins, like the production design of Gotham is, yeah. Do you remember the narrows and everything? Yeah. Like it was just yeah. a, a horrible shithole instead of just a regular dangerous city. <laughs> yeah. So every time they showed like, decrepit you know derelict part of gotham and everything and also everything was like brown and orange in the night night scenes they didn't opt for cold and sterile and, yeah and everything so um it changed that the was, whole color palette in, when the, in the latter movies yeah it got cold and and weird yeah um and then i guess if i could sum up the rest of our conversation was um uh we were both a bit surprised that the world that they created was um I, I thought it was going to sit slightly less realistic than the Nolan Batman films. And if you really think about it, like these villains are even more root, like grounded and rooted, like the, the Riddler's just wearing a trench coat and using like far right channels on on the Internet and stuff. Right. And um, and really what it means to me is that going further in this series, it's going to lock out a lot of fun Batman villains. And it's going to basically turn into the um, uh, uh, the the Christopher Nolanization of villains in terms of dumbing them down to something more reasonable to happen in a real world. So that's very, that's a good point. It's a bit of a bummer in my opinion. Yeah. I still feel like I, I was telling someone at work, uh, <clears throat> the following Monday, I was like, you know, I, my favorite incarnation of Batman in, in, in media is probably still the, the Arkham games. Um, obviously I love the animated series, but like, I feel like the Arkham games, you know, combined the best actors who who have ever played these characters, you know, from, from Batman and the Joker, Mr. Freeze, like all that is just, just great vo- voice casting, great action, great production design. And the villains were a mixture of lived in gangster level people and like, you know, Clayface <laughs> and like, yeah, that was the one that I, we brought up. Yeah. yeah. It's very gritty and very realistic, but it's also, it's a comic book villains. So I, and I wonder like, am I, is it a, is it a choice on the level? Like, 
I feel like if I feel like the direction that, that Marvel does its stuff almost feels like something that could split the difference between those two elements better. But DC seems or Warner Brothers seems to have made a, a certainly a, by now a choice of, well, we need to be putting out a product that feels different than that. And we feel like our characters don't quite fit that kind of aesthetic and that kind of tone. And I, so I wonder if like, I'm sure there's a way to, to do Batman as satisfying as the Arkham games on, on them in a movie without sacrificing the gravity of Gotham and the characters. Yeah, yeah I agree. I wonder if that's just going to happen like 20 years from now when we haven't rebooted the franchise a bunch <laughs> and we're comparing it constantly. I mean, like what's funny, by the way, we're comparing it to the Nolan films. People are comparing it to the Nolan films. I hear everyone comparing it to the Nolan films. I haven't heard one person go, yeah, he's, he's, I haven't heard one person bring up Ben Affleck or, or Zack Snyder. <laughs> like, well, it's cause it's, he never like, really got like a full swing at it. Yeah. You know, yeah. Th- this was supposed to be his swing. Like when it was initially being developed, I think there was like, anyway. And then like that whole death stroke thing in justice league, the Snyder cut was supposed to tease his role in this movie way back when it was going to be a Batman, a Ben Affleck movie. Uh, I think anyway, Affleck. I, I, I'm, I'm glad it became this. Um, I, uh, by the way, the cinematographer, uh, what's his name? Uh, oh, I scrolled away from his name. It was his a very pretty is, movie. It was, you said? Yeah, it was, definitely. Greg Frazier. Somebody and faxing something? Is, is someone, lowering my desk. Is someone printing? <laughs> John's got an uplift. I'm sitting down now. Uh, <laughs> um, faxing. Uh, I'm sending you the name of the photographer, uh, the cinematographer via fax. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Stand by. <laughs> are, you, are you getting it? Do you, do you have it? Yeah. It just becomes an ASCII dog. <laughs> yeah. well, John, I think you're out of ink, buddy. It's uh, I can't really yeah. read it. It's just a bunch of bleeding pink lines. What was I talking about? Oh, Greg Frazier. Um, Greg Frazier also, I was like, oh, what else has he shot? You know, Dune, <laughs> which... Also had really pretty cinematography. He's um, been busy. Yeah, he's been really busy. Um, but before that, like Rogue One, Lion, uh, Zero Dark Thirty, and then, you know, Let Me In back in 2010 with Matt Reeves, um, you know, among a bunch of other movies. But I just, I remember that was one of the things that was the most striking about the movie was just looked, it just looked great. Like so many of the compositions were just beautiful to look at. Did y'all, how do you feel about Robert Pattinson? as Batman, as Bruce Wayne, um, in, in, in general, I, I felt the same as I did with the movie. There's nothing that jumped out at me as like, I'm not sure this is the right direction, but there's nothing that I don't know if I'm qualified to say who's a good, like what a good Bruce Wayne is and a good Batman is. I think he, you are. He was okay. Well then I will. Um, I think he, uh, <laughs> I, I think I, I, I was fine with him as, as the character. I thought he was very stoic, um, as Batman typically is. Um, so I think it, his performance to me is more of an absence of missteps than it is, um, virtues that stand out. But I just think that when you are, when you are doing a performance, that's really understated and really under beneath the surface, like, like Batman um, it's more in what you don't do than what you are doing. Maybe. I don't know. Yeah. To, to your point, like the reason I said that you are, is that I think Batman exists as a cultural icon more than like, yeah, I don't read the comics either, but I've seen every single Batman movie that's come out and I feel like well, I can say what makes a good Bruce Wayne, but um, uh, I'll just reiterate what I said before. If they're going for like a character to like uh, arc for him, and this is him like two years in, I think, uh, of being Batman. And like he's going to learn that the other half of being Batman is to be kind of like the playboy billionaire, you know, philanthropist kind of guy. Um, maybe that's to come. But I really I would I just couldn't stand watching uh, Bruce Wayne scenes in this. And thankfully, there were pretty few of them. Um, anyway. Yeah. Yeah. For me, I. <laughs> I kind of agree, Kellen. It was a very different Bruce Wayne. But part of the good thing about the, all these films is each one is so different. Each version is so different. And I feel like we've seen the Playboy Bruce Wayne before. And and so this like with a lot of the characters in this, it was just kind of like 
this is this penguin is different, but we've seen like so many versions of the penguin before as well. So it's like, yeah, as long as it's compelling to me, you know, it works. And like, I don't think Robert Pattinson, like the performance didn't have the range of someone like, you know, a Christian Bale where, where you are going from like this very charming Bruce Wayne to Batman. Um, but I think the characterization of Bruce Wayne slash Batman in this was really good. And I think it was a lot of just Robert Pattinson just being physically there and physically embodying that character. Um, I don't think there was, a, there was no scene where he was giving dialogue or something that blew me away, but um, just that physical presence was really, really good. Um, and the, as far as the characterization goes, I do like that it was more of examining what makes Batman a symbol. And I like that aspect that he was basically inspiring all of the criminals in Gotham city and the Riddler and all of these people, he was inspiring them and emboldening them to be better villains and be, but continue being bad people. And then by the end of the film, he realizes, you know, th there's more to being a hero than being the vengeance. I have to be a leader and, and a symbol for hope as well. So that was like a really interesting deconstruction of that, that the other films hadn't done. And, and this didn't do some things that the other films did. So it was just, it's like Batman is like that one character that you can just mix and match elements. And it's like, it's all valid because, you know, comics are written differently than they were 20 years ago, which is different than they were written 40 years ago. And TV series is different than it was when we were kids and stuff like that. So it's, it's like a broad character. So it's just kind of like, as long as you have those, those general aspects of the character, right. And, and it's compelling and, and the changes you're making are justifying themselves. Um, it works for me. So I'm curious. I'd like, I, in terms of like going forward, when I left this, I was like, ah, I kind of don't want there to be any more. Like I liked that this was like a, a almost, it wasn't small scale. Like it was like a huge multi yeah. you know, hundred million dollar movie, but it was, it felt like a lower scale, like Batman Begins did where it was just kind of like more of like a crime film. And it, when you compare it with something like an Iron Man movie or something, it felt very low, low, you know, um, low profile. So I would kind of be happy if we, this was it. Like, I, you know, so that's because, a because segue. obviously I think for a sequel, you're going to have to go, how do we make it bigger? And we're going to have several villains and, uh, you know, I don't know. <laughs> um, uh, to, to inject some Dustin voice into this as well. Um, one of the things we talked about, he's talking about how, how he loves the versatility of the character of Batman. Um, and yeah. we were talking about things that we, didn't like and things where we thought, you know, oh, this means going forward, it's going to not be able to be this. It's not going to be able to be that. And um, we we were talking basically about how um, I I and he agreed. I wouldn't mind if if Batman movie going forward, just fuck it, cycle in a new guy to do a new take on Batman every like five years. And I'd be fine with that. Like, I don't need to see another one of these. I know they're going to because I bet you this is going to make Buku money. Um, and if they do, a friend of mine was like, yeah, in this movie, he's vengeance. And the next one, he realizes he has to be better and he's going to be justice. And so I think they are going for an arc. Um, but yeah, I think it would be pretty neat if Batman just became a different Batman in every other movie. Like, yeah, I'm looking at the, at the Wikipedia. There, there are plans to... <clears throat> they are intending for it to be a, a first of a new Batman film trilogy. Some people have signed on for future films. Um, I know that Pattinson kind of wants to develop him a little more. So it says here that Pattinson and Reeves expressed interest in introducing Robin and featuring the court of owls, calendar man, Mr. Freeze or hush as villains in a sequel. Mr. Freeze. How are they going to do Mr. Freeze? I, see, I don't want to see Robin. I, I, I like, I just, you know, once you start introducing these bigger world aspects of it, yeah. I start to lose interest. That's, you know, that's kind of how how I tend to feel. I just i i i really want them just to focus because because you know we're we're developing Bruce Wayne. We're developing him from fresh Batman, fresh anger at you know the city at crime at you know the personification of you know those who took his parents from him. Um as long as we're focusing on that and populating the movie with characters that 
have direct influence on that, then, then fine. You know, it, right. if, if Robin helps with that, that, okay, then maybe, but like, like what I liked about this movie was that he changed. And, um, so I mean, that's, it, it's, it's a, it's a noir film, you know, it's, it's not, it, it thankfully doesn't feel like a big superhero. God, I keep doing that. A big, like a big epic superhero thing. Like there's no action scene that feels like, Oh, this is, this feels like a producer's note to put an action scene here. Like everything felt natural and motivated and paced well. And I think if you want to keep directors like Matt Reeves interested, you can't make it dumb. You can't come to him with a bunch of dumb ideas for a sequel. And like one of the reasons he did Dawn of the Planet of the Apes was, I didn't forget the name of the movie. I was trying to make sure it was the right movie I was talking about. Um, it is one, easy to get them confused. One, one, one of the reasons he did that one and then he stayed on for war. Two or three. Oh, yeah. Okay. What, yeah, the second, two. second, third. Yeah. And then the reason he did the two of them was he said, they, they gave me the time I needed to make the film correctly. They didn't rush me. And this was Warner Brothers, too. They didn't rush me to, uh, to get the film out by a release date. I told them. When I made Dawn, I think that he had like two years to make it. No, that was Fox. Was it Fox? Okay, I'm sorry. You're right. Yes. Well, different studios and so maybe what else. But but the point <laughs> is, Matt Reeves told you know the studio there's like there was two years and he said, okay. And so at the end of the doing Dawn, he said we can do it in two years, but I would really like to have three to make the next one the best it can be. And they said okay. And you know for him to you know basically just lay out in front like. This is what I want to do. Cause if they had said no two years, he might've gone, okay, well I'm not sticking around then, you know, <laughs> like, and right. I, I respect that. Uh, but back to the, the, uh, what were we talking about before that? I'm sorry. I got on a, I got on a thing. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I don't want to see uh, a bunch of, a bunch of Batman. I don't want to see a shared universe. They're talking here about making it a shared universe with DCEU. I just, they already said they weren't going to well, do they're that. They're already doing a penguin spinoff show. Right. Yeah. Yeah. On HBO Max. And, and and I guarantee you that's because Peacemaker did so well. They can't tie it into the the they can't. There's like that's no, strange yeah. that's strange credulity, credulity credulity so much to like say that yeah. this Batman takes place in any of this other shit. Uh, a friend was saying they're going to try to tie Joker into it and I'm like, "No, like no, especially yeah. cuz they just had that horrible cameo at the end of this which we can talk about as well." Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that definitely felt like a studio, a studio <laughs> note for sure. Oh my god! Yeah. Before I'm so sorry. Uh, well, uh, just a small note, I guess. But can what do you want to talk about, Joker, or do you want to talk about Paul Dano? Because we haven't mentioned Paul Dano yet. Let's go with Paul Dano since he's actually the villain of the movie. <laughs> <laughs> Paul Dano. Paul Dano is great in general, not just in this film. Paul Dano is great in everything. What sealed me wanting to watch this movie was the casting of Paul Dano. I mean, I love Matt Reeves, but then you get to, oh, Paul Dano's going to be the Riddler. It's like, I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> I am 100% in. Um, Paul Dano effortlessly is the most menacing and threatening individual that I never hope to encounter in person because I'm legitimately <laughs> afraid of him. <laughs> Um, he, even though, even if you watch a movie like Swiss army man, where he's just a delightful, you know, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's such a great movie. Please I watch movie. Swiss, Army. Swiss army man is, have you seen that, John? I haven't seen it yet. Oh man, my God. Really? It's him and Daniel Radcliffe. Yeah. It's, it's so good. Please watch Dan, it. Daniel Radcliffe. I do. I, yeah. But I need to that, check it out. Yeah. yeah. Daniel Radcliffe is a corpse. He plays a do right. Anything. Yeah. <laughs> it's great. Um, <laughs> Um, but Paul, Paul Dano is, is, is just really, really good in the movie. And, and, you know, it takes a real strong villain and it's not like, Oh, Batman, did you think that I would find out your secret? Like it's a lot of movies have the most boring villains in movies are the ones that just feel like stock villains from when we, when we were kids, just like, man, villain threatening, threatening kind of you know, deep authoritative voice, but just kind of generally like, I'm going to take over, but I, and I'm intelligent. And like what we've, what we get with our most interesting villains in these days is stuff that comes out of left field. Like, would you have pictured 
the Riddler as like, you know, basically like a Zodiac killer type of guy with Paul Dano's voice, you know, his high voice, like, and his random yelling, like that was so good. I just, I don't know. I'm just, I love Paul Dano. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was great. And, and it was, I think he really did a good job once the mask came off, like once he was captured and all that stuff that followed that. Yeah. Um, because there was, there was the scene where he was like singing, Ave Maria, and I was like waiting for my theater to start laughing, and no one did. It was like just like this packed theater; everyone was silent. I was like, "Okay, he's pulling it off." Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, it was it was very creepy. And we I, we haven't seen like a like a perfect adaptation of the comic Riddler on screen yet. Like obviously Jim Carrey wasn't wasn't that necessarily a different thing. Not not bad per se, but different. Um, and this wasn't that either. But it was it was still like a menacing villain that. Um, brought like a new level to the movie um, and, and it just, it worked. It was creepy, uh, definitely Zodiac Killer-esque and, yep. and um, still maintain those like core elements of what the Riddler is. So um, yeah. I liked his performance um, and it kind of goes back to how they had to realistically portray a kind of, you know, over the top character. Um, my issue with the Riddler in this is that, um, how did you guys feel about him being, it's not justice. He's also vengeance. Like Batman is vengeance because his, he's only killing people that are like, you know, bad people in the grand scheme of things, massive corruption, blah, 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 blah. Right. So like, I didn't hate him for it. Um, so really what it came down to is that I don't think that it was a good foil for Batman. Uh, Because Dustin and I were talking about it. Batman never in the entire film um, uh, heads the Riddler off at the pass as far as like his plot, his plot. Uh, Dustin has a quote here where he says. "Uh, World's greatest about Batman, world's greatest detective, question mark, more like world's greatest understander of what's already happening. (laughs) Uh, Like so every time something would happen, like uh, Gordon would be like what does that mean? And then Batman would be like, it means this. And it's like, cool. You never prevented any of this stuff from happening. You just kind of mitigated it where you could, like you even delivered him, uh, Falcone for you, you to murder and everything. So I, I liked him as a villain, but I thought the dynamic between him and Batman made me respect Batman less, I guess. He definitely outsmarted Batman. And I think you can kind of chalk that up. He was manipulating Batman the whole movie. Um, And and you could kind of chalk that up maybe since he's a new Batman. I've always considered the Riddler, you know, on a level in terms of intelligence at or above Batman, though. So it wasn't like, I don't know. It didn't strike me as odd. But um, yeah, it definitely made Batman at the end of the movie look like, you know, he he was played, played, you know. Yeah, more of a critique of Batman than the Riddler for sure. So I I liked the overall choice going back to the with all right channels, whatever you're saying, Kellen. Um, I liked the, I, I liked the, I liked the social media, um, uh, uh, dog whistling, uh, aspect of the movie that they incorporated in. That was something that I felt was really, there's a couple choices they made that were really, really contemporary that enriched the film for me. And it was, it was the, the dog whistling to the followers, like, you know, go to the thing and dress like me, you know, and like just the disturbing nature of just like, yeah, pack the ammo. And uh, you, if you, if you twist, if you, if you adjust your sight this way, you can, you can shoot more accurately from further away. It's just like Jesus Christ, because that's, that's like, that's real, you know? Um, and the other thing was, um, I think that, uh, give lending, lending a type of social justice angle to the character's consciousness, like, like, uh, like, you know, Zoe Kravitz for, for Catwoman, that's always going to be a thing. They did a little bit of that in the dark Knight rises, you know, I mean, like it's, it's a good character to contrast with Bruce Wayne, who is wealthy. Um, and for the Riddler to have some kind of, you know, I don't want to say cause, but like, that's, that's what he's doing. That's like his, his, that's, that's kind of his mission throughout this is to, you know, expose, punish corruption, expose corruption. Um, uh, people who've abused power, going back to another point we made earlier too, about the way Bruce Wayne behaves in this movie versus previous movies. Like he's not playboy in it everywhere. Um, and I wonder if that 
not only beyond this film, but I wonder from future films that will, I mean, it might get tweaked a little bit, but I wonder if it's because we just, we have people like Elon Musk and other billionaires that, that don't behave the way billionaires in the mid two thousands did. He's a lot more reclusive than like Christian Bale's Bruce Wayne was. And although that might be like a key aspect of his character, like his, his mask as Bruce Wayne, I do wonder if they're going to go that route at all, because uh, this is all tied into one big subject of there were contempt contemporary attitudes were considered when they wrote this movie, whatever, whether it's about the social, the socioeconomic climate, the political climate that would be affecting different uh, sectors of Gotham. And also just the way that those different sectors behave, the anger of the underclass, the reclusiveness of people like Bruce Wayne. I don't know. It just felt it's another thing that helped establish and build the world for me. I think that's a good point because, you know, if you did a temperature check on what young people think of billionaires now, it's a, they'd probably like to see someone who was modest about it and didn't want it. Um, But I think in this movie, he used it to, to make himself feel better by like getting revenge, you know, vengeance and stuff. Um, and I don't know, who knows, maybe the, the next movies he'll realize, you know, oh, I should do stuff with my money, even if it's right. just to throw people off my fucking trail. Because so. <laughs> that would be something. Well, it was like that, that the mayor, um, was it the, the mayor or the. The progressive mayor. Yeah. She's yeah. Like, the, you could the mayor said something like, money. you know, your family has a history of philanthropy and you're not really doing anything. And he kind of thought he was in his own way. And so that's like going forward. I think that you're going to see a lot more of like, I'm actually going to commit to making a difference and not just like beating up, you know, petty criminals and thugs and stuff <laughs> just to kind of like work yeah. out my own issues. But that's, that's true. <laughs> yeah. It's like give millions of dollars for this, like children's fund or whatever. No, I'm going to beat the shit out of people on a subway yeah. platform. Yeah, some, exa- some exactly. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it, yeah. It's like, he sits down and he's like all depressed. He's like, why am I not happy? I beat the shit out of so many people today. What? What's wrong? <laughs> am I not beating the shit out of enough people or am I not? <laughs> Got to up my shit beating quality. Uh, I, do, I do have to say too, for that scene where, where that opening sequence where, you know, all these, all these uh, crimes are happening the criminals are looking in the darkness and you expect oh. that man to walk out that when it, that finally happened and that music score came out, oh my God. it was like, Oh, Oh, and like, I can't like the score is, it is like, one of the best parts of the movie to me, it was like so instantly recognizable. It was essential. And it was just defining. Yeah. I was yeah. explaining to my wife, like it's essential because if you're going to have a movie this long, there's several key tools you have to employ to keep pace. Yeah. And you can either have a bunch of action scenes, you got a bunch of sweeping camera moves, a lot of people talking fast, like an Aaron Sorkin movie. But what is it? What do you do in a, in a, in a, in a noir detective film with a lots of nonverbal storytelling? Right. You've got to have a good score that, that keeps momentum, that keeps you engaged. And it, and it right. did. And I'm like a huge fan of the Danny Elfman score from the 89 movie. And like, I, I never thought that any other Batman with theme would kind of like come up against that. And I'm not saying this is as good as that, but it's great to hear like a separate theme that is so like just instantly embedded in the profile of the film. And it was like that sequence uh, in the arena when the, roof explodes and he drops in and he starts like taking out the domestic terror Riddler guys. And it was like, uh, the music is playing and it was just like, I don't know. I had chills. I was like, this, this is, yeah, this is what it's all about. Kind of just just like everything came to that moment. Yeah. And again, like, like the sound design was fantastic. The sequence with the Batmobile and it it was great seeing in the Dolby. You could feel the rumble of everything. And (laughs) it was the same way with apes. Like Matt, Matt Reeves does a great job you know, uh, orchestrating all that stuff. But, um, and Michael Giacchino was fantastic. And so it, it just had a lot of behind the scenes players in this that really knocked it out of the park for me. And also too, like the production design in this was fantastic. Like yes. we were talking about like the, the blandness of dark night, dark night rises, the yeah. setting, like this was almost to me, like the, the, uh, 
it had a little bit of like Anton First's production design for the first, like Batman 89, but it was more grounded than that. It wasn't quite as gothic, but there were like sequences where they pan over the city and you could tell that it wasn't just some city, right? Yeah. They, yeah. Maybe maybe parts of it were, and then they embellished it in, in post or whatever, but yeah. it, had, it had a real texture to it. And um, even like John Turturro's office and things like that, like really, really well done sets and um yeah, you could tell they spent the money in the right places on on stuff like that. I don't know. Does does anyone have any else anything else they want to bring up? Do we want to talk about Zoe Kravitz or do we, or do we want great. to talk about the Joker too? Oh yeah. Oh god. Uh, but I will I will say I like Zoe Kravitz in this a lot. Oh I mean, yeah. I, I thought she I was great. Too. A lot of people I heard a lot of people who all separately brought up Michelle Pfeiffer is still the gold standard. I don't, I don't it's just need, different. I, it's been so long since I've seen any of those. Um, but I I really liked her in this. I liked her I liked her her choice of accent was very noirish, very dame, you know. Like, listen, honey, you just gotta get out of Dodge while you can. And I was like, this feels detective-y. I like it. Um, but it was uh I I thought I thought she was really, really great as as Catwoman. And I liked their their dynamic and I, I liked how, you know, how they resolved that and everything. I just thought that that was a pitch perfect portrayal of the relationship between Batman and uh, Selena Kyle. I liked how the movie ended with them driving away from each other. And that was what they chose to end the actual narrative on. And it was just kind of like that, that, that whole bond was really strong. So it's, I don't know. It really worked for me. I don't have any complaints, um, but I'm also just like, never been a huge Catwoman fan uh don't tell Dustin well he'll, he'll hear this uh it's just it's just not one of the aspects of um Batman stories that stands out to me I guess is the way so I, I don't have strong opinions but I do I do think she did great is there a particular villain you think would work well in this new uh in, in like a, in a Matt Reeves trilogy um particularly I mean I mean it's any of the thug gangster ones like uh uh what's his name is it Black Mask or Black? Red? It's Black Mask. Yeah, there. Black Mask was just in that uh, Birds of Prey. He was uh, Hugh McGregor. Oh, oh, yeah. So it might be too soon. Oh no! Like part of me wants to see like Mister Freeze, but again, I, like I, I would be fine if they just called it quits with this film and this is it. Um, yeah, because once you start, I feel like once you start, like in my head, it's like, oh, Mister Freeze, they could make it work, and it's no, like, you know what yeah, they're gonna but, do with Mister Freeze? Though? Though. <laughs> they're gonna make Mister Freeze have like some paralyzing agent where he like injects yeah, people or something it's like, gonna be you know a, what I like mean? a very he's yeah. you know janky it's gonna looking be a made costume yeah. He'll, yeah. Be like a, he'll be like a uh a kevorkian doctor. sort yeah, of kevorkian yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah and that's gonna like just make me roll my eyes and go just just give us a more fanciful batman just do it the, well yeah. so if if we're going more fanciful i want Clayface. yeah um and, because and just just having a who who the hell is who thing for detective mm-hmm. yeah. i think is just is interesting it's are any of you X Files fans, or were you? I've never seen. No, there was um. There's a character in old old seasons of X Files named Tombs, and he was a guy who could squish his body through tiny spaces, <laughs> and and like okay, you laugh. I don't know. It was just really spooky. And if you treat Clay like Clayface, he has to inherently be supernatural. Yeah, uh, just to to do those things. But like. There is a, a good spooky tone that they set, but they just didn't lay pieces to allow for weirder shit in the movies. And that's the yeah. biggest bummer that I have about it. Yeah, th- right. this, this is a very I mean, from that very first scene with with the Riddler, it's a it's a horror film. Um, it's it's scary. It employs horror elements in its filmmaking. And that was one of the most effective things about it. I feel like doing a character like Mr. Freeze requires you to tell i mean the whole thing mr freeze is his wife and you have to tell it's almost like that has to be part of his story otherwise you're just not doing yeah. him justice right right so that means the next movie has to somehow involve what happened to his wife and it's just like as much as i love mr freeze he's probably been done the best he can be done in the animated series and oh have, yeah, I, I get, agree with you there. You yeah. have to get a villain who has much less of a personal story that has to be told. Like that's what works so well about the Joker among, among other things is you can just plop him into a specific, into any kind of plot and you don't have to explain how he became the Joker. That's what the dark Knight right, proved right. was. You don't have to explain how he became the Joker. Just, we all know who the Joker is. Just put the Joker there and 
we'll be like, oh my God, it's the Joker. And he'll be like, oh shit, Wait, it's the Joker. Will we? <laughs> well, and, here, and, and that brings us into, that brings us into this. Villain, uh, villains I don't want to see in a sequel. Here we go. So I'm always up for the Joker. And I think, but this might be, if this is a trilogy, this might be the first Batman trilogy that needs to say, we can't do the Joker. We need to stop because we had Jack Nicholson and that was great. And we had Heath Ledger and that was great. And then we had Jared Leto and that was not great. And we've got Joaquin Phoenix, which is fun, but for different reasons, you know, and we just need to stop and we shouldn't tempt fate in this new trilogy. Like let's, let's make it, let's make one more without the Joker. And if we really find that our, our story is missing that element, we'll make the Joker the third one. And if we fuck it up, oh, well, we made two good films and we made an okay third one. That's, yeah. if I were an executive, that's how I would talk. I would just be like, yeah, if you fuck it up, it's, it's okay. It's the last one. That's why I'm really hoping that this was just an Easter egg. Not even an Easter yes. egg, it was blatant. But like, I'm really yeah. hoping that this guy who is probably in his mid thirties, but comes across like a 16 year old with the voice of a 16 year old is not going to be the Joker because I actively like winced yeah. and like <laughs> <laughs> turned away. I was pained. Yeah. Hold your nose. It was bad. If, if read to me like a post credit scene that was moved into the main film uh-huh. at the last minute or something. Yeah. And it just felt like red meat to all like the people that were like, Wow, this Batman was depressing, and I hated it. Oh my God, there's the Joker, though. You know, it's like, and he's terrible. That's, that's how red to me, and it was like they were so cool. They were like, we're not gonna say it's him, but but you know it's him. Yeah. And I was like, Ugh. that was like that was like one scene where I was like, oh no, you know, because because like I'm sure you guys go into movies sometimes in the first hour, you're like, I'm really digging this, and I hope they keep up the momentum. Please keep up the momentum, and. That was like one scene at the very end where I was like, whoop, it kind of stumbled for a second. And I was like, oh, and then it just kind of went away. And I was like, oh, my God, we'll just pretend that that didn't happen. And thank God it was like at the end of the movie. But yeah. Ugh. Yeah. We just need to give it a rest. I mean, how many it's almost like the like the character is too marketable not to include, I think. And you know, I wonder if that's what Warner Brothers yeah. is thinking. Like, yeah, we, we've got to put him in there because he sells tickets. And I just I don't yeah. know what's yeah. going to prevail if Matt Reeves is going to go. No, please. Or if Matt Reeves will go, uh, I was thinking the same thing. Let's do it. <laughs> I yeah. I, I mean, uh, yeah. And, yes. and this movie kind of spat in the face of like any sort of fan service to me. So including it felt disingenuous to an extent. Dustin said, Batman villains are great. We don't need nonstop Joker. Um, yeah. He's had too many Jokers lately. Give him a rest. And that he thought that that s- specific sequence felt fan filmy. And I agree. Yep. Yeah. Fan films don't get to do a bunch of casting. They just kind of go, eh, you, you work. And yeah. it really feels yeah. like he wandered onto set and they were like, can you laugh creepy? And it's like, oh, a little. <laughs> you sit in well, this room. Talk to did Paul you guys Dano. See Eternals. He was in that, right? Yeah, that actor was in the Eternals. I know him from Green Knight. He was the guy pilfering the dead bodies on the battlefield. Oh. Uh. I would have never known it was this actor, but after looking at it, I was like, okay. But y'all, would you, okay, so would you, I guess we all sort of said that we'd probably overall responded positively to this in terms of, if we're going to make Batman movies, this is kind of the direction, you know, they they ought to go for the most part. I mean, what I liked about it, it was it, it was, yeah, for now. It, it was, it was not gimmicky. It was very like, let's just, let's get a good, solid, good, solid foundation. And then we can, you know, receive the critiques and talk about what's next and you know just kind of try to do a good job on the first one yeah. and we'll get some stuff together yep i just wouldn't yeah. mind if they got a little ballsy and broke the world wide open instead of instead of keeping it on a narrow path and i think that i think that they might be able to convince warner brothers that that's the way to go and say like look if you ever want to, you know this to be a part of the universe we need to get kind of weird I mean, you know. there's a flooded Gotham City. What if Killer Croc is just going to show up in the second? <laughs> and I will say this too: like, I do trust. I, I sound like a Matt Reeves like fanboy or something, but I do trust him. Like, I, I've never he's, seen a bad film of his. One of those his instincts are right always now. really good. So, yeah. if he's involved and he's writing it, like, and he's like, "Yeah, we're going to do Killer Croc," uh, I'll be like, "Yeah, I'm on. I'm on board. I have no reason to doubt you at this point. I don't know, you know." So, yeah, yeah, he looks like someone we went to college with. 
but I like him. Now I have to look him up and not not not, not a specific not person. Them. He he looks like a scad student. I'm just, oh, I'm just saying, thought, he just in general. Not I, yeah, I, I could see that. Yeah, I thought I was gonna <laughs> Google search him and then say somebody's <laughs> name out loud on your podcast. <laughs> no, no. Woo. no, he just looks like he looks like one of those people. Like I look at him, and I'm like, oh yeah, I've seen you in the I've seen you in bike cafe. JOs <laughs> bike cafe. Yeah. Um, if I can JOs. say one one of my least favorite lines in the film, just as a send off for my opinion on the film, was yeah. that Batman. Sorry, Bruce Wayne literally said the words "You're not my dad" to Alfred in the hospital, <laughs> and I was like, "Way to sum up emo Bruce Wayne!" And I'm really hoping we move on from this. <laughs> no, I'm not your dad. Stop pretending to be. <laughs> I will say too that was funny because it was like Alfred was that had almost the line? died. That was the line. I think it was no. That was that's the line from Spider Man. Oh, okay. Ooh, way <laughs> but it was like head. Alfred. Alfred is like, oh man, I saved Master Bruce from that explosion. I, I hope I'm all right. And then like he wakes up in the hospital. And he's like, oh, there's Master Bruce. He must be coming to thank me. And he's like, you're a fucking liar, Alfred. He's like, what, what is this now? You know? He's like, my face is all burnt. You know, yeah. I'm in the hospital. I don't know how long I've been out. Can can somebody died. can somebody some or uh, uh, answer this question for me? My two of my I went with two friends. One heard one thing. I One heard the other. And I'm on the fence. One of them thought Alfred said when I was in the service, like I think he was talking about like the SAS or something, British yeah. uh, Army Service yeah. or something. And the other one thought he said in the circus. And I was like, <laughs> whoa, 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 we've got a Batman character that's from the circus already. And uh, granted, he's not in this film, but I don't think Alfred was in the circus. No, Alfred was in the circus. S-E-R-K-I-S. That's the joke that yes. we were making, but um, I'm sorry. I'm, did, I, did I just explain the joke? <laughs> I'm I'm pretty he sure was it was the circus the, service. He was the service. I did appreciate that it started with a brutal murder. Like I was like, oh, all yeah. right, this is Batman. Like, yeah, <laughs> that set the tone right away. Yeah, uh, somebody was talking about like uh, their kid going to the Batman movie with them, and they didn't say anything about how like they found it objectionable. But I was like, yo, yo, dude, just gets his head bashed in. Like, yeah. With a blunt object in the first like five minutes of the movie, I saw mine at uh, Disney Springs, and uh, when I was getting up, there were like kids, like in the theater with me, and I was like, "Good God, a how'd you sit through all this? <laughs> the right. Like, who brought you to this? I, you know." All right, y'all, that was fun. Twice. All right, indeed. Let's do it again sometime soon about something else. Word up. Yeah. Sounds good. Okie dokie.